More often than not, game development is a team endeavor. However, there are times where you might feel like you're a one-person army. What can make all the difference is how you take advantage of the production tools at your disposal to make your life easy and the lives of everyone on your team easier. And our next guest is going to show us just how to do that. Salim is the co-founder and studio director of Co-op, an artist-run and owned game studio. Originally from Kuwait, Salim has a background in cultural analysis and media studies, has organized and administered research labs and games, and is a community organizer in Montreal. Salim is also self-taught, figuring things out on the fly like many indie developers, and is always looking to gain perspective. And now Salim is going to show us that production is self-care. Hi, my name is Salim Dabous, and welcome to my talk, Production is Self-Care. So I'm super grateful that you could join me for this, and I hope you find it useful because as an independent game developer coming up in making games on my own, I have felt like there's not a lot of conversations about production and how to get into production. In my consulting with other small teams, it is commonly the number one issue that I see repeated across a bunch of different studios um, where production isn't really well understood uh, or there isn't even a producer or strategies for how to uh, become a producer. So I wanted to talk about that and why specifically it is self-care. So one thing I found in a lot of my consulting is that there is a lot of skepticism over production and its importance or need. It, there seems to be this stigma that it is something that comes from AAA or non-creative studios um, and that it could stifle innovation or stifle creativity. And I really, I used to believe that too. And I really uh, want to talk about that and dispel some of those myths. Uh, so first, I'm going to talk about myself real quick. Uh, I am the co-founder and studio director of Co-op. It's a tiny indie studio based out of Montreal, Quebec. It's a worker-owned co-op, so that means all the full-time employees at the studio equally own the studio. Uh, my, my background is actually not from games. I studied cultural analysis and media studies, and I worked as a lab admin in video games, in a research lab for video games. So my job was to essentially think of organization and workflow and people and how all of those things interface, which incidentally became a very good uh, sort of testing ground for learning about production. Um, I'm an immigrant. I grew up in Kuwait. I'm originally from Lebanon, and I'm basically completely self-taught. So I'm just figuring things out like the rest of us and that also means that there's a particular bias and perspective that I have that may or may not be applicable to your individual circumstances. So always keep that in mind whenever you're watching any talk, taking any sort of advice, uh, just recognize that sort of survivorship bias that exists. Co-op's history is, uh, you know, for a studio that is nine is, Basically, we started out with a bunch of canceled projects and then moved on to games that we actually figured out how to ship and are now running a pretty smooth ship overall. Um, originally, we started off with these games called Skipping Stones, uh, Red Rover, Fledge, and none of these games ever came out because we didn't know how to ship them. Uh, and we overscoped, didn't have proper production practice, and in generally was a pretty stressful time. Uh, but it was also really exciting because we were learning a lot. You know, none of us had real games experience before we started the studio. So there was a lot of learning by doing. And then came Knock, uh, which was our first commercial release. Uh, it was published by Double Fine, a game that I'm super fond of and very, very proud of. But shipping Nog was probably one of the worst experiences of my life. 
I was waking up on the regular at 2 a.m. on the dot, just stressed out of my mind, unable to sleep. Um, when we shipped that game, three of us got super sick. I, I ran a fever for five days straight, I think, because my body just completely fell apart. And so much of that is because we didn't have proper production practices or knowledge. And so when I say production is self-care, this is what I mean. Because if you've ever tried to ship a game that you have some funding on the line for and your studio and your job, your livelihood is on the line, that stress really, really eats away at you. And it hurts you so much and it hurts the people around you as well. And so that's why I say production is self-care because good production protects you from that. Last year, we announced Goodbye Volcano High, our biggest game to date. It's about a group of teenage dinosaurs in their final year of high school. Uh, and just as they start senior year, they find out that a meteor is coming and the world is going to end. This game is really close to our hearts and it's also our biggest project. We've grown our studio to account for it and we've had to like make a lot of changes for it. And at the end of the day, we truly believe GVH is too important to the studio to fuck it up and to make the same mistakes that we've made in the past. So a lot of my discussions over production are born out of the learnings that I've gained by producing Goodbye Volcano High, which I'm the executive producer and co-director on. So real quick, just a note about workflow, uh, because if you come away from this talk and you're like, oh, hey, there's some really good ideas that I want to institute with my team, something you should know is that workflow changes take time a lot of time. And it's not something that you can just point to a talk and be like, hey, we're going to do this from now on. It requires a lot of buy-in from people. It requires a lot of small incremental changes and observations and tweaks. And it requires a lot of understanding of your personal context and your team's context uh, to adjust your workflows around. So for us, as we recognized our pain points and changed our workflow, I would say it was anywhere from three to eight months before we solidified uh, as kind of this new lean machine that works really smoothly together. Uh, it takes time. All right, let's get into it. Project management versus production. At its core, I think a lot of people just don't know what a producer is. And even worse than that, a lot of people think they know what a producer is, and so they have different definitions. And so when you're communicating with different people about production and a producer's role, it can get really murky and people think they're talking about the same thing when they're actually talking about completely different ideas. Often people assume a producer is a project manager and they are not. And I think that that's a very fundamental distinction um, to me, production is a extremely creative discipline. So it is the discipline that focuses on the high level, the overall project, managing the team, the dynamics, the requirements and the needs on a global perspective and making a lot of decisions that will impact how the final product that you ship will like what the shape of that will look like. While a project manager is much more focused on the day-to-day -day logistics and planning and scheduling, um, project management is an amazing skill that I don't have. And so I have hired a project manager to do those things so that I can be a more effective producer. I think that that distinction is really, really critical. And oftentimes in smaller studios, the, that person will be one and the same, the producer and the project manager. But I think it's really important to recognize that those are different skill sets and you might have one and not the other. And so for the longest time, I thought I was just a bad producer because I was really struggling with scheduling and logistics and planning. And then just realized, actually, I'm really good at what I do. That's just a skill set that I haven't uh, developed and need support with. And I think one of the hardest things about getting into production is that when you Google these things and these concepts, you run up against uh, a lot of agile bullshit. And what I mean by that is that there's so much like talk about agile and methodologies and scrum and sprints and velocity. And it starts to become this like giant buzzword thing where you read a bunch of articles that are like 
SEO to hell and make no sense and just feel like they're um, not really written even for a video game context because they're not. Uh, so there's a lot of bullshit to wade through, but I actually really believe in agile as a methodology and a framework that you can apply to video games. Um, but not something that you would want to follow wholesale uh, as it's sort of like laid out in books that have been written about it. Uh, but I think that they're really, really important to understand from a production standpoint for a producer because they fundamentally help clarify the path forward for how to make entertainment software and how to ship it. So this is just a, a, an example of a production schedule proposed. And I'm sure you've seen stuff like this or even made stuff like this. And you're like, okay, I'm gonna make a vertical slice. It's gonna take us this many months. Then we're gonna hit alpha. It's gonna take us this many months. Then we'll be content complete. And then we'll be live ready and whatever. And the thing about this is it's kind of a pipe dream because how do you know what's going to be happening in 18 months from now when you're still figuring out the shape of a game or the shape of the architecture or the shape of what you are building, especially if you're in an exploratory phase and with video games and software, that is so often the case, you are kind of figuring out what you're making as you're making it and letting it sort of reveal itself to you. Um, often with a lot of internal metrics and external metrics like play tests. So how do you, propose a realistic schedule when you haven't even figured out a lot of the core components of your project. Um, and so to me, the way we do this is by abstracting away production between art and code. So we treat those as two very different disciplines and we apply different production methodologies to those different disciplines. To me, art production is mostly a logistical challenge. It is a lot more of a project management challenge. Um, it's once you're out of the exploratory pre-production phase where you kind of know what you're making and how to make it, you essentially are just figuring out how long does it take everybody on your team to produce the assets that you're creating and how that's going to fit in your overall schedule and pipeline. Um, but code production, on the other hand, which I think is the central critical part of a lot of video game development, <laughs> I think it speaks for itself. It's like, it's really scary. It's really hard. How do you predict um, how, what you're going to be building in eight months when you're figuring it out for the first time, especially if you're a new team and you're working together for the first time? So in programming, everybody is constantly reinventing the wheel. Uh, and rebuilding things all the time. So we wanted to get away from that. And what we've sort of figured out at our studio, which is made up of a lot of people from outside of games, is to take a tools-oriented approach. So programmers create tools for the design team to implement ideas and, and, and be able to like test out things and create new designs using tools that programmers are, uh, or engineers are creating for them. But you know, indies tend to have a lack of engineering bandwidth, or at least in our case, as an indie, we do. Um, we're not like, you know, that like very stereotypical, like designer, programmer, boy genius model that like was very uh, heavily focused on in the like 2010s. Uh, so that's not who we are. So we've had to account for different production methodologies to uh, let our design team work effectively and in an iterative way through our approach to creating tools. Also, we found that a lot of producing code was a team challenge, more so than an engineering challenge. Uh, our programmers were working on their own, kind of in the dark, uh, on different disciplines. They didn't understand each other's code. And we were constantly finding situations where we would like build something and then come back to it like six or seven months later. And it was completely broken because so much of the project has changed that nobody realized that that would break something that they had made you know, ages ago. Um, and so one of our main focus was to figure out how to uh, build in a team approach to programming. And this is production. This is what producers do. You find the pain points, you find the problems in your production, and then you solve them. And so we 
recognized that we had a pain point where our team of programmers were all kind of operating on their own. And so we found solutions to change that together holistically. Uh, so we figured out, you know, we implemented code reviews so that people would look over each other's code before it was checked into our main branch, which helped code go into the branch uh, with less bugs, but also meant that there were a lot more uh, of knowledge sharing going on between programmers since they were reviewing each other's code. We designated a kind of process lead, somebody to own workflow and processes so that when there were questions about how to do something and what the process was, there was a point of authority uh, until it became a habit. We also implemented things like code discussion, where instead of having a programmer have a challenge and they would go off and try to figure it out on their own, they would come to the team and just kind of, you know, set an hour, talk about their problem, talk about their strategies, and everybody could pitch in solutions. And we also introduced pair programming for whenever people needed it or wanted to learn uh, a new discipline that a, one programmer maybe had, like say a programmer knew a bunch about network code and another didn't. And if they wanted to learn, we would do pair programming so that they could learn together and share that knowledge. And that really opened up a lot of uh, avenues for better methodology, more predictable output for programming. So. You know, programming is a house of cards and it's constantly changing uh, and that makes planning really hard. So we use production tools to deal with this. What I talked about before was a team based production tool approach where we solve things through workflow and processes. But we also have uh, things like velocity for uh, planning the future, estimating how long things are going to take, uh, predicting how much a feature is going to take out of your timeline. Those are really, really important things. And velocity is a really hard concept at first to wrap your head around. Um, but basically to break it down, we don't track programmers hours. So we don't track how long it takes someone to ship a thing or to ship a feature. Instead, we assign an arbitrary point value, like say one, two, or three to each task. Is this an easy task? Cool, that's one point. Is this a really hard task that's gonna take a, like more time than you know it's going to be? Cool, that's a three. And what you end up finding out is that programmers are really bad at predicting how long something is gonna take, but they're pretty good at predicting if something is going to be complex or not. And so by tracking velocity and how many points a programmer is able to ship in a in any given sort of time box, which is a sprint. So say you plan a two week time box and you plan a set amount of points for a programmer and then you see how many of those points get delivered as finished tasks, you can start to gain a pretty accurate prediction of your programming output uh, per time box. So per two week sprint, we know that we can hit maybe 20 points of features. So when we're doing our planning for future sprints, um, we take that into account and we start to average all of our sprints and point output and are able to like pretty effectively predict how much content we're going to get done on a programming side, which is amazing and helps you uh, plan things so much better than, it, than being like, okay, well, we think this feature is gonna take you know, 30 hours or X amount of weeks. And then when it's done, we'll be hitting this milestone. It never works out that way. So it's a lot better to break things down into much smaller chunks and then point estimate them out and iterate on that uh, repeatedly. See if you're falling short on your estimates. See if you're over, like if you're hitting way more points than you estimated, then, you're, then you know to adjust your estimations. I think this is a really critical tool in both just agile, but also just technical production um, that becomes really important. And I'm not a programmer, so I don't know how to program or code. So, but I still understand how to talk to my team because we talk in terms of points and velocity. It's a shared common language uh, between tech and production. And finally, the last piece of that puzzle for us is DevOps development operations. And DevOps is basically, so much of our workflow in game development is pain, like straight up. It's doing a bunch of repetitive tasks that we keep like making builds or uh, integrating art assets or whatever. Things that you manually have to do over and over and over again. 
um, that has a lot of human error. Whenever we identify one of those pieces, what we do is automate it under the DevOps principles. And I'll provide some links at the end that will help kind of expand uh, what those principles are. But basically, wherever you can automate, you do it because you take things that are easy for computers to do super quickly and efficiently with no errors, and you make the computer do it instead of having a person do it. And that increases your iteration loop and your like you reduce friction for your entire team. And it ends up building out really um, calm sort of workflows. Instead of having like, oh, it's build day. We have a milestone. We have to make a build. And oh, shit, the build is breaking. Oh, my God, what's happening? You have a continuous autonomous process that's always running in the background so that when it's build date, well, you always have builds running every day and it's completely handled in the background. You don't have to worry about that. It makes your team way less stressed, makes you sleep well at night, and it makes your team focus on the things that they actually care about doing, not rote grunt work that's really, really tedious and error prone. To me, DevOps isn't a tech thing. It is production. It is workflow, it is processes, and it is self-care. I'm Salim. You can find me on Twitter at Simo. And here's a list of talks that I think are really awesome and really expand on what I brought up during this talk. Okay, I hope you have a great rest of your Game Devs of Color Expo.